and access to logs, shot lists, call sheets, call sheets. For me, that one is, is, is key. Um, and I know there's a lot of data stuff, data privacy stuff around letting the edit producer see it. But when you're looking for something that's missing, when they've used a card to pick up the end of a card to pick up something, and you have to do that kind of detective work, having a call sheet is like so crucial. So the title for today's session is Problem Free Post-Production, which uh, I'm sure everyone who's here is uh, going to be slightly rolling their eyes and laughing at because obviously post-production can go wildly out of control and is rarely problem free. Mm -hmm. But that is why we wanted to get together because we five have all spent sort of an awful lot of time in dark rooms, probably far more than is healthy. And we've observed all sorts of things going right, but also going wrong. And uh, we know every production is different and every post-production is different, but we wanted to share some of the insights that we've learned um, to try and make things mm -hmm. run more smoothly in the future. Cause obviously edits are really expensive if they overrun and also really stressful. And uh, we also wanted to hear from you, any tips that you've got, any insights, things are constantly changing in the post-production world. So, um, you know, we're not saying we've got all the answers by, by, all, by any stretch of the imagination. This is an info sharing session, peer-to-peer, non-critical, non-judgmental, and just like communication is key. We wanna say what we know and we wanna hear what you know. Um, so we will get going. So we'll start with Emma Comans. So Emma's been in post-production for over 15 years. She was uh, in-house with Tiger Aspect running their post and then has worked at lots of uh, huge post houses like Clearcut and Molinaire. And she's now set up her own company, Flying Fox, and she is a post-production supervisor, which is a fairly new role. And um, so I'd like to start by Emma, could you explain what this role actually is? Yeah, so um, it, is a, it is a new role and um, traditionally it's been a drama and a film role on, um, on our series and films and now it's become more of a, a feature doc and unscripted position. So we are kind of the, the link between production managers, productions and the post houses running, working with the editors, working with assistants, working with dits, working with the channels and being that sort of liaison and having the overall supervision of the post-production process. So why has this role <laughs> developed in unscripted then? And, and why is it required in your opinion? Because productions are getting bigger and more complicated. So traditionally it used to be a lot of channel four, National Geographic discovery shows and as the things as everything was getting bigger with rig shows and more complex or more complex archive and the feature dogs came into it with your streamers and SVODs everyone needs that that role to be a bit more niche and a bit more have a bit more knowledge because it is a bit of a production manager style role but you can't expect a production manager to know all the ins and outs of everything and post is is becoming more complicated so that it, it's covering that okay so what sort of projects or series need it would a sort of six part um single cam series need a post production supervisor or is it more multi-cam and things with lots of formatted different types of formats of camera and cards and rushes yeah and absolutely i mean at the moment my team are working across such varied productions like uh, long feature docs, which are very archive heavy, single camera, but shot over a long period of time and developed over a long period of time. And the edits run for 20 to 24 weeks, the big final post to big nature series that have been developed for two years and are shooting all over the world or multi-cam, multi-rig productions. Um, like the one that we all worked together on, Big Flower Fight, which was shot, you know, multicams, lots of lots of contributors, lots of microphones, all the edits running together, that kind of thing. Okay. 
So your top tips then, Emma, with this is the crucial question. Um, what have you learned from no doubt some tricky experiences? What would you say are your, your top tips for making things run smoothly? At the moment, my top tips would be to, to get your post supervisor in early, even before at your budgeting stage to, to help ask the questions that you need to know. I've often been the silent negotiator for, for, for quotes for post houses. So I've fed a production manager a lot of questions that she should ask because I've worked in a post house. Um, the importance of a dip so I've learned that the, that the DIT is, the, is the, sometimes the most important person on your location. Could you so, explain, sorry, what a DIT is actually? Oh, uh, your DIT is your, uh, used to be called a data wrangler. Now they're a bit more of an experienced person who um, will back up all your rushes on set, but they'll, they'll QC them, they'll verify them, they'll make sure your system is correct, they'll help lay out your your workflow with you and with your post-production house to make sure that when you get your drive at your post house, it's beautifully organized and it saves you time and money. And also it helps your edit because you need to make sure that things are backed up in a way that will look nice in the avid. Okay. Um, some more some more top tips would be to meet your meet your final post team early. So meet your audio, meet your audio team, meet your picture team. I was sat on a um, on one of the Netflix kickoff meetings recently, where we had our entire team like weeks before our shoot, and we could ask questions of of the audio team about mics and talk to the picture house team about what frame rate and what LUTs we should we should be using. So it's 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 framing. It's it's only helping you, you know, months down the line in pre production. That's really interesting. So it's basically joining up the conversation. So post isn't the add-on at the end, no. it's right involved at the beginning so that the communication is really clear throughout. There's mm -hmm. less that is unexpected and, um, and therefore less that can go wrong. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then right down to things like assistant editor, assistant editors and assembling editors often they're seen as a luxury in our in our genre like factual entertainment documentaries but they can just save you so much and their their knowledge they're not just a person who sits in in the machine room ingesting your media they're they're an you know important part of your team and i think that's also coming into um into the way that we work so the weeks before your editor comes in and they're grouping and syncing and sync pulling and and working through your, your transcripts and helping frame the edit for an editor to come in and not sit down to a avid full of rushes that he's got to watch. Okay, brilliant. All right, well, that's great. So let's move on now then. We'll come back to you, Emma, but let's move on to Tom because uh, Tom is an editor, but also is a brilliant edit assistant and he's so technical. Um, Tom is basically your man if you've got any query about anything technical. He, he just seems to have an encyclopedic knowledge of everything. I don't mean to make you blush, Tom. And he Google, also <laughs> he also runs um, a really huge and popular Facebook group called I Need an Edit Assistant UK. And so basically he's your man to find an edit assistant and to ask any technical questions. So... Um, Tell us, first of all, Tom, what exactly does an edit assistant do and how is it different from an assembly editor or a junior editor or um, an, an assistant editor? Well, there's a joke that the junior editor is just an editor that's cheaper. But, um, but yeah, uh, so, well, it's like, basically, there's different types of edit assistant that you might come across. So you have your MCR edit assistant, which might be a lot of people's first step into post-production coming from a runner in a post house. And that's at the beginning a very technical job and they might just teach you ingest and that's it. And, uh, and that's what they do, but then you will move up. So an assistant can be anything and from just ingest all the way up to string out. And that's where it turns into assembly editor where you're doing paper edits, string outs, small assemblies of the actual, um, what the editor will then cut down 
and um, just creating like a, a very easily organized project for the editor to come in at because in the end the assistant can also help with technical stuff syncing and grouping which is a funny term in itself because it might come in in, in that be locked in synced as like your different uh, cameras your multicam but they need to be grouped together in a multicam so the editor can cut it quickly it's just a ton of jobs and it, it it's, as ever said, it's, it sounds because it's got the word assistant, it might sound like it's a luxury, but really what it is, it's a way of streamlining the entire process and quite a lot of times just being a bit of a hub of knowledge of where things are that makes it a lot cheaper and quicker as a process in the long run. Absolutely. So in your experience, um, when should an edit assistant come on board a project and how how in advance before the editor actually starts because there's a lot of organization which which you do which meet saves time for the editor because the editor doesn't need to do all that organization and can get on with the creative work when when things are organized clearly and they can navigate the rushes presumably so how long would it take or is that a well, how long uh, is a piece of string question i don't know yeah, but there's also like a, a really good thing, which is basically a lot of times an assistant will come in and they'll find things that could have been avoided um, if they'd have been called in earlier, as everyone in every job normally does. Um, so if you could, if you've got an assistant in house or you want one for a job, the best thing is if you book them in advance to come in for a couple of days and sit down with the editor, with the camera crew with the everyone and you sit and you just hash everything out so the editor will want it set up a certain way you can it's everything from roll numbers all the way up to like what's the different color spaces on different cameras that you can then say oh well those two cameras will have different looks we need to send them to the grade or this kind of camera has a different codec to another one and that will cause um, a longer period of ingest or might have storage implications, which you could talk to the post producer about. And you can just get rid of all these problems. I've had productions um, that have had massive problems with storage and ingest that's nearly sunk the whole budget. And it's, um, it's not their fault. It's just because that they, they didn't know. And why would they? So it's really like, just get them in as early as you can and we can get all these problems sorted. So you don't have them in the end. And I think there's this real assumption that everybody kind of knows what they're doing on a production and therefore can just get on with it. But it's, productions are all done so differently. And I can imagine, you know, when an edit assistant starts on day one, if they haven't been on the shoot and haven't been briefed clearly, how are they meant to organize this, these rushes into sequences that make sense editorially for the editor and edit producer when they come in because you know and I think all those lines of communication need to be joined up don't they because you are not um you know you're just looking at cards and numbers with with information on it and you have to make it make sense for you and for other people using it so well in, in an ideal world like I said at this beginning meeting before like right after it gets commissioned or even before like you could have this meeting you can go through like character sheets, what you need, because quite a lot of times if they're still shooting and you're sitting down with a bunch of rushes and some roll numbers, you might not, they say, oh, I want Bill's interview. And there's like nine bills. If you've got a photograph and a character sheet, you know who you're pulling. And that, and then you can also pass that information on to the editor. So when the editor comes in, you're like, oh, Bill's great. He's a bit kooky. He's this guy on this photo here. I put some notes actually, he says some funny things. And that's where like the assistant isn't just a technical job. It can be a creative job. Most assistants want to become editors or move into creative situations. And that's information they can pass on. They can cut down stories and they can really be helpful. And the dreaded, the dreaded GV pass, which takes so much time. And I've, and people come and go, like, Oh, whilst you're doing all this, could you please get the GVs? And it's like, well, for some jobs, that's a week getting all the GVs and sorting them all out. And like, it's a really big job. And if you can get assistance in early and they know what you're looking for, what's your structure of your program, um, then they know what GVs to look for and what to find out. If you just handed a big bag of rushes, 
you won't know what's important and what kind of feel you want. And the, um, the terminology, I'm oh, sorry, I'm gonna ramble, which is a really quick thing I wanted to get down is terminology is a really important thing. So when we have people coming in and say, I want an OTF, that's an on the fly. That's when somebody's moving and they're film and they're talking. And when there's a PTC, that's a piece to camera. That's when they're standing still and talking to camera. And just an interview would be a master interview might be in a different setting. That's a myth. Mm -hmm. And if we, if you put these, for example, these into stone, what they are, when you're going through the edit and the footage, you can then pull them and you know what they are. And this navigation through communication just would kill so much time and would take it from fixing to making the best program. Um, but there's loads more. There's like camera movements. And if you just have terminology in a document, you'd be so much quicker. Yeah, because I think new terms sort of spring up all the time. I remember on our big flower fight, there was this, this uh, concept of a pod. And I kept on saying, <laughs> what is a pod? Does it, is it a POD? Does it stand for something? Or is it, what is it? And nobody really knew what it was. But, and it was used for master interview. Mm. And nobody really knew why. But um, anyway, once we all knew, okay, it's an, we don't know where pod came from and why. But anyway, these are pods. Then everyone was like, okay, can I have the pod for X? Can I have the pod for this person? But um, yeah, some... It, you, I think people shouldn't be scared about sort of saying, what no. is this? Can you explain? Because there are new terms that sort of get invented even. They're not like, a, it's not standardised, is it, necessarily? Yeah, and, and, and although there are courses back around and screen skills is very good for this, a lot of people in TV, and I, I feel like the, the support network in post is actually really good. And especially for assistants, we're really tight knit. And because it's changing all the time, there's a new codec every five minutes. There's a new play out system every 10 minutes. And like, we have to know it. There's no like, so there's some really good support networks through Facebook and that, but I don't think production get that as much. And there's not a lot of cross, you know, communication. So please just come. Like if you're worried, if you're a PD and you're shooting on this and you're not sure of the camp frame rate and that's right, and we don't have this, just go to the assistant, go to the tech. Like, there are no real stupid questions because we're all learning at the same time. Everybody's constantly learning. So you need to be able to communicate and, and feel open that you can ask a silly question because otherwise you'll just make it up on the, you wing it and it will always be wrong. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, we will move on now to Pete, and I will no doubt ask lots of silly questions of Pete. Um, so Pete is a really experienced actor who I believe worked on the first or certainly some of the first Big Brother series, and um, also worked on 24 Hours in A&E, uh, Grand Designs, The Apprentice, SAS, Who Dares Wins, and um, is a brilliant editor. So um, you started about 20 years ago, I believe. And um, so tell us how much have edits changed and got more complicated? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I think we should say a massive thank you to, to the likes of Tom and, and edit assistants all over, the, all over the world, because, you know, 20 years ago, it was a much simpler playing field. You had a digi B to tape or a B to tape, you would put it into a machine. Maybe you had two cameras if you were lucky on a shoot. Um, Nowadays, you you know you might have nine cameras, you might have iPhone footage, you might have GoPro footage. You've got a whole plethora of different formats, and that in itself causes quite a massive headache. So it's a huge job, and I would absolutely echo uh, Tom's thoughts. Edit assistants are vital, and if you can have one throughout a production, then brilliant. But yes, I mean you know, sort of today's rig shows, there is obviously the benefit of um, having had other productions that had similar sort of uh, workflows already going on, so people can learn off others in that respect. Um, so certainly you can work on a, on a rig show that might be on its second or third, fourth series, and, it, and it's quite a well-oiled machine. But then conversely, you know, I did a job just before uh, Christmas, which was a, a new, uh, it wasn't a rig show, but it was multi-cam, sort of PSC reality show. 
and that production company hadn't hadn't sort of done that sort of thing before as far as I'm aware and it was difficult it was it was quite hard work but they did have edit assistants on hand the whole way through the production and that absolutely saved editors a lot of time <clears throat> because at the end of the day when you you know you go into your edit on day one you might be sat working with someone that you've never worked with before so first of all you've got you've got that sort of slightly weird dynamic where you have to you know form a relationship with the person that you're sat with that you might be you know sat with for the next sort of eight or nine weeks plus you might have you know a ridiculous deadline to, to turn around the first rough cut within you know, eight or nine days. So you want a fighting chance to sort of get to that deadline without it be becoming too stressful. And the, the only way that can happen is if, you know, you've got your sort of ducks in a row and, and, and hopefully things have been sort of set up sort of how you want them, or at the very least, you've got a few basic things like, you know, uh, pictures of the contributors, uh, a microphone list of who's on what microphone, you know, transcripts, if they're available of the master interviews, that sort of thing, just looking at my list, because I, I, I sort of forget what they were. But, but the, you know, it, it's at the end of the day, it's like any job, you want to be able to sort of turn up on day one, and have the tools, you know, to, to sort of get, have the best chance of uh, getting to the to the end, without taking, you know, anyone down in the process. So it has, it has changed quite a lot. But um, in essence, it's just bigger. It's the same thing, but bigger. That makes sense. But with all the multicam, obviously, the it takes a long time to to group them and to sync the sound. And if you, the editor, have to do, has to do that before you start actually watching and thinking about what what material you've been handed, that wastes a lot of time, doesn't it? Absolutely, yes. I mean, you know, in the old days, you mentioned Big Brother when when that started. I'm not sure about the sort of the more recent stuff, but certainly in the first decade of it we would digitize our own footage in we would you know run to the tape room grab the tape for for that particular scene or, or the two or three tapes digitize it in and and so you had that benefit of having to watch the footage and you couldn't actually do anything because you couldn't edit until it was ingested or you'd, until you'd digitize the material so you had to watch it which which in, in some ways was good because you were that time factor was allowed in, in you know in your edit schedule you had time to watch but nowadays, you know, you, you come in and you, you know, you might have 24 hours, well, you might have two or three days worth of 24 hour groups clips that you've got to watch all of that stuff and edit it down in, in time. So, you know, that there are a few kind of things that can definitely help. And I think it is hard for, for assistants if they're not briefed properly or there hasn't been the time to sort of brief them as to what is important and what and what might not be important so you might end up getting getting given a, a sync map for example 24 hours long with 64 mic you know microphones on it and and the cameras now obviously the the assistants might not know that it's not you don't need the microphone from the toilet 24 hours a day as it were you know in a, in a rig show you can get away without having the microphone from outside all the time so it's just sort of it's great to have that the whole thing in case you do need it but then it would be even better to have what i sort of call a simplified version which is just stripping it right back so you can then go right day one first the first scene i have to cut is this scene it's got these three contributors there's those three mics bosh 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 i can strip everything out apart from that bit and just and cut that scene quite quickly if you're starting to have to sort of wade through, you know, tens and tens or dozens of, um, of audio tracks and that sort of thing, it can just, it just massively slows you down. So it's all about sort of streamlining things as, as best as possible. And obviously, you know, if, if it were possible, you would sit down, like Tom said, uh, with, with the team beforehand uh, and Emma said as well, you know, and, and sort of talk it all through and have almost uh, that sort of pre-production meet or pre-edit meeting. So everyone can discuss different things and sort of put their input in and then you get started. But, you know, edits are time critical, there's money. And I think some people probably think that's time not well spent, but actually it would massively benefit everyone. My wife, uh, 
my wife is a, an exec. She's on a production at the moment. Their shoot is still going on while uh, the edit has already started. That's causing headaches because you don't have that sort of handover. Uh, and a lot of knowledge from the shoot is, is on the shoot still because the team aren't back from the shoot to sort of pass on that knowledge. So yeah, it, 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 it can be a minefield, but I think in a way, it's the sort of simplifying things that just gives everyone a, a fighting chance to, to get things done in time. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that it's most simple. It's everybody knowing what is needed at the right stage. And I mean, the Avid crashes all the time, doesn't it? If it has too much information that you're playing with. So if, if the edit assistant knows what the editor needs, then you're providing it in the right sort of format and in and the right sort of level of complexity so that a you can manage it and also the avid can manage it because crashing avids waste lots of time as well doesn't it well exactly i mean I, I think you know as avid technology improves it's become easier and easier to group to group stuff for example in the in the old days well not even that not even that long ago you would have to you know if the camera operator stops recording you would have to you know so your clip stops you have to regroup you know regroup your clips uh, and make a new group sequence whereas now you can pretty much put the whole 24 hours down on a sync map right click sort of tom's waving he's, he's not sure he's, he's going to tell me i'm not right i'm definitely not the oracle of this by the way but in my experience i've sort of found that if you get given a for example a 24 hour sync map uh, sorry, 24 hour group clip that which which happened on a series that I did recently because the edit assistant just didn't know that that was going to be a problem. When you went when, as soon as you match frame back hit play, which is a sort of reflex action for an edit, for an editor, the yeah, avid crashed. And so every edit suite was just you, know, you could hear it, you could hear it down the corridors, people shouting at the, at the machine because they've forgotten that you couldn't do the sort of match frame play, which is, you know, which is a very standard, you know, every every edit producer, every everyone in TV knows that frame, oh, just match frame back with that. And you match frame back, hit play, and, and, you've, and you've broken the avid again, another 20 minutes. So yeah, that those sorts of things, just, just kind of breaking it down into bite-sized chunks. So you don't have a 24 hour group clip, you've got maybe a four hour group clip instead. And then, you know, you can manage it that way. So that, that sort of thing helps as well. Oh, Richard is asking, what's a match frame edit? It's, uh, well, well, okay. well, when I say match frame, so if you've got a, a clip of someone uh, and they're running up a hill and someone goes, oh, is there, you know, is there a bit more of that shot or is there a, is there a, just, uh, uh, what a, a bit of the shot with his with, where you can't see his head you would hit match frame to go back to the source clip and then you can spool through the clip at that point so essentially you're just finding that finding the, the original clip rather than just your two or three seconds that you're using and that's that's quite a sort of it's a big thing is it rather than having to go oh let me go and find that clip in the in the bin as it were which can take a long time you just hit match frame and you're there and you find it it's, it's basically your 101 that is you want your but that button set up on your keyboard from the get-go i think that's probably one of the most important fantastic thank you well we'll come back we'll come back to you pete we'll move on to anne-marie so Anne-Marie is a really, really experienced edit producer. She's also SP and exec, and she's worked on a wide range of programs from Big Cat Diary to the wonderful world of chocolate, Paddington 24-7, Rich Kids, Skint Holiday, and all sorts of other things. So basically formats, Obdoc, wildlife, you name it. So, um, oh, you're on mute, Anne-Marie. So I'll just remind you to unmute so that I, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, so obviously, as an edit producer, I know you've PD'd as well, but when you're edit producing, you haven't been on the shoot. This is an experience I often have as well. So you obviously on day one have to sort of get up to speed as quickly as possible with what's been shot, with what the programme is. Um, what sort of information do you need in order to do your job as efficiently and productively as possible? I think the most important thing is arriving in a room with a computer. 
Okay. <laughs> because often that doesn't happen, a laptop for the edit producer or a computer. Um, and access to logs, shot lists, call sheets, call sheets. For me, that one is, is, is key. Um, and I know there's a lot of data stuff, data privacy stuff around letting the edit producer see it. But when you're looking for something that's missing, when they've used a card to pick up the end of a card to pick up something, and you have to do that kind of detective work, having a call sheet is like so crucial. Um, also, the other thing is, and Tom mentioned it, I think, thumbnails of casts with names. I mean, absolutely crucial, especially on things like if you're working on a blue light series, oh my gosh, no, with 35 policemen, you know, it's just like, well, who's that one? And they've always got their hats on and you're like, oh my God, oh, it's a woman. All right, maybe that helps me thin it down to this person. So very, very basic things like that to start off. Um, access to some kind of viewing system, whether it's VLC, making sure the computer has VLC on it or any other kind of viewing, absolutely vital. Um, internet helps. Yeah. <laughs> so with the viewing platform, I think um, sometimes edit producers are just given something and it's assumed, oh, well, you'll, you'll know how to use that. And I mean, I think with an editor, for instance, people wouldn't say, right, oh, today you're going to be using, you know, Adobe Premiere if you're an avid editor. And, and people would know that would slow an editor down. But, but it's the same for an edit producer. If I'm given some completely new viewing platform, then it's going to take me a bit of time to work out how on earth to use it best. And I would like a bit of training on it, for instance. I know avid logger now seems to be the most popular that I've come across yep. for the edit producer yep. to use. But that for me has taken quite a long time to get my head around. And I'm, I'm now okay at it, but I've done a lot of YouTube tutorials, but you can't necessarily assume that, you know, when you're given a new piece of kit that everybody knows how to use no, it, can you? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And there are so many different ones that are being used, you know, cloud-based systems, other kind of cloud-based systems where you immediately have to start, you, you know, you. When you're on your first day, you know, as Pete has pointed out, that maybe in nine days time or eight days time, somebody is going to want to see something. So you've got to get your head around the subject or some shape of the subject and immediately start making sort of editorial type decisions. Um, and that's what is, is expected of you from day, you know, so you need to have everything set up so you can do it. And I think we need to touch on um, working remotely because that's what life is at the moment for edit producers, you know. Um, so you're set up at home that allows you to access all these things. Really yeah. important. How, how are you finding remote edit producing then? Is it is it working OK for you? For me personally, yes. Um, I, the first, so last year I worked with an editor that I knew, so it was easy coming to the end of last year and into this year, I worked with someone I didn't know. So that was a very, um, interesting take on this arriving in a room with another person that you've just got to stay in that room with for eight weeks and make it work. You've got to find out all their little foibles, how they do things differently to you, work out how you're going to make it work together, because the bottom line is, you're not there to make a friend with that person. You're just there to act professionally and produce something at the end. And, you know, so in a way, working from home helps, but everybody has different pressures. One of the editors I worked with, he had children at home that were being homeschooled. His wife was working from home too. And so there was this whole kind of, for him, a complete change in pattern of how you work because meal times became more important. Um, the kids break from homeschooling became more important. And so there's me waiting, thinking, all right, so we'll get this done by sort of two o'clock. And it's like, no, it's not gonna happen like that today. This, this, this happens, you know, and it's just like, so for me, 
working from home has meant that my day has stretched, which sometimes this sort of blank period in the middle of the day, and it's the sort of intensity of the first bit and intensity of the end bit, and this kind of weird kind of, so it's really affected the schedule and also um, sort of hitting those viewing targets. But that's just my experience. I don't know what other people have felt. I think I think that's yeah I think that is a common thing mm. so so we can talk more about that and everyone give their perspective on remote working in a minute I was just thinking about um hitting schedules and things like that what um because I think sometimes dead you know, what with um transmission dates and just trying to save money and things like that that viewing deadlines are really brought forward and then edits try to find a way to hit those deadlines which sometimes can be a bit bizarre um for instance like three edits making one program with two weeks each and all running concurrently now i think it may be in theory that seems to be a good idea to make a six-week edit but in practice i <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work you need one team seeing a program through from start to finish uh, because you can't break a one hour show into thirds and then three teams make it, in my experience. Um, have you found any unusual schedules like that and expectations? Yes. I mean, I think what one of the really interesting things also is that when they split the edit, they never think of part durations. So they, you know, so people doing part one would get a week and a half or whatever. But then they'll think that the people doing the slightly longer part get the same period. And I'm like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that because you've got more minutes on screen to sort of try and build. And then also, I don't know about everybody else, but how I work in my edit is, I do a kind of very rough part one because part one kind of doesn't get nailed properly until you know definitely what's in your other parts. And that whole way of working, you know, where different edits do different parts, it just kind of makes it very hard because you end up re-editing, re-editing, re-editing something that you thought was working. And then as things get moved around because of viewings and stuff, you're just like, oh, okay, so we need to go back and move that out of there then because they don't know that truth yet. So we, we need to, you know, and, and it just throws everything into a complete stressy mess. Yes, I think there are other ways where things can work better. For instance, if you split up a program into different stories, and so different suites are doing an entire story, and then yeah. some another suite yeah. is a stringing suite or a finishing yeah. suite and tying That's them right. together. Yeah. But, um, so I mean, it is interesting thinking about which ways do work to try and sort of break down a one hour show into, so it can be made more quickly. But Certain things don't work in my perspective. No. Um, On chocolates, what we did was we had like um, each episode had a main chocolatier that we we followed. So like it was Cadbury's story or a Fry's story or something. And one edit just dealt with that. And it's like a historical piece based on archive. And you just go with that story beginning to end and then the other suites did the other bits and then in the end it all came back to you and you stitched it into one episode so and that kind of worked though it often meant you having to re-edit bits that were given to you from other suites because they didn't know you know what was happening along the spine so it it's you know but the, the key is time 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 which we don't have because yeah. it costs money I think the other thing which takes a lot of time is doing notes and um, the number of viewings and the number of people giving notes. And I think if there's some way of streamlining, so you get delivered one bunch of notes, which is everybody's thoughts together, rather than lots of different people's notes coming in at different times, because doing notes takes a long time, doesn't it? Yep. I think grouped, grouped viewings like where you have the SP. I mean, sometimes, you know, there are decisions being made above you. And, uh, and, and so having a view with an SP first might help. Um, but essentially having a view with the SP and the exec at the same time, because they might be coming from completely different directions, um, really helps. And then 
you know then that you have something that is closer to what the commissioning editor wants. And then you know that you'll get those notes. So you get two lots of notes instead of potentially three notes taking you hither and thither across the edit. Yeah. I think Peach, you wanted to say something about that. Oh, no, no, sorry, someone came into the room. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the whole, um, you know, I've, I've had it both ways where I've been a stitch editor, I've been a story editor. I think as long as you, you've, you've set up from the beginning that there is going to be the stitch phase, mm. then it can work. But, mm. but certainly there's been edits, again, the one before Christmas I did, we, we had the three suites cutting, uh, sorry, the, the four parts being cut between three suites mm. over the course of seven days, because that made up for the same amount of time on paper. But it, was, it just doesn't work. There was duplication of, of interview, there was duplication of footage, and there wasn't actually time allowed for a stitch either. So it was all thrown back together as four parts, sent to the, sent to the channel, and it's like, oh gosh, that's, uh, that, when you actually watch it, you know, that, that's not very clever. And it just makes everyone, you know, you've done quite a lot of hard work, and for it to sort of fall apart just because that time wasn't allocated for that part, is a bit unfair because it makes everyone look a little bit foolish. Yeah. I think when you when you split, what I found really helpful at before is that um, if you've split the parts, then you have on the transcripts, you color code. Each suite has a color and you color code if you've used that sink. And then that way, nobody else can use that sink, you know, and it's that sort of thing helps and it stops things being duplicated, you know, but yeah transcripts are amazing and invaluable and I actually that has to be expressed that if you've got transcripts and logs or field notes which are time of day um, recorded it just saves the edit so much time um, it's just so much quicker to look back at you know paper to see what was on each card than to go back and have to re-watch cards to try and find something that is like a needle in a haystack, isn't it? So oh, I think that- Can I say one thing, sorry yeah. to interrupt, just really quickly, I've crossed a couple of notes with Pete and yourself. There are some points where like an assistant would love to come in on all of these things. So what my, my main leg up when I, from assistant to editing, I'd cut like, snap-ins and stuff like that which is another thing snap-ins like if nobody knows what they are they're like a weird anomaly which is basically if you're playing a show in a different country or if it's got a different runtime you need to put in a bit of show that really doesn't matter but also has to be watchable so it's a weird thing very time consistent and a lot of editors hate doing them because they're a pain you can hand that to your assistant mm -hmm and they will love it. So you're taking something that's time consuming and to you probably quite boring and annoying and giving it to somebody who's actually gonna put some time and effort and love into it. And it streamlines and notes, some notes that are just basic notes. Again, you can just hand that to an assistant and they can bang through them and then give them back to the editor. And if you have that repartee between the editor and the assistant, you're passing down great knowledge to an assistant who wants to then edit and they take that on with them when they're assisting and as I did when I started editing you end up setting up projects and thinking how Pete does like and stripping out the sound or going like we need to so on Big Flower Fight which I worked with Emma we had tons of characters and what have you and I had to go through the whole thing and strip out each contrib mm. and put them into their own thing Low, if, I, if we'd known in advance, I'd to have more time. It takes mm -hmm. a long time, but it's mm -hmm. essential. But you only really get that as an assistant if you work with an editor quite closely to know what an editor wants, and then you learn how to edit. So it's like this amazing- A win-win situation. Yeah, everyone works out fine. And the same with the transcripts. You can hand paper edits to an assistant, or you say, can you find me this bit of sync? And then you and the editor can get on with what you need to do. And then suddenly you get a, a phone call and you've got a bin with all of your bits of sync or all of your shots there. Mm. And it's just, and when it works well, it works so fast. 
and I just really I'll, I'll stop it's just I the that's what we had in, inside the ambulance which moved up I had an amazing, amazing exec called Daisy Scouchy and she just really kind of gave assistants jobs like oh just cut this story and then you cut it and then I had a great edit producers and editors who were like just do this and it's worked and it helps everyone and then you, suddenly you've got an extra editor on an assistance wage. Mm. So everyone's winning. Somebody is asking about script sync. So I will answer this whilst um, other people are thinking of questions and things they want to say. I used script sync on an American series recently, and that is a way of importing transcripts into Avid. Mm. And then you can search on the transcript and it brings up the footage and it is absolutely brilliant. But as far as I know, I don't think it is used on very many British TV programs. I'm using, at the it, I'm using it now on a on a feature doc, which is British, but it's been cut in the states. So it's got a it's got a US based assistant editor who's like hammering through scripting, which I'm going to take through to other projects now because I think it's brilliant as well. Yeah, I don't know how expensive it is. Oh, somebody's just asked, is it expensive? Mm -hmm. I literally have no idea, but it does save a lot of time. You can upgrade your version of Avid to Ultimate, and it's not hugely expensive, but it's included in it. Okay, and you knew of something a bit similar, Pete, to that, didn't you? Yeah, um, I think it's called Descript. And I mean, it, it, it has its sort of, uh, you know, it has its problems, but on the whole, it massively saves time. You know, the, the sort of the tendency for frankenbiting and edit sweeps is, is now becoming the norm. And, you know, so, it's not acceptable to just say, oh, we can't use that because they didn't say it right. It'll be a case of, right, well, find that word and replace that word so that they sound right, you know, so they have the right intonation or whatever. Mm. So to be able to find those individual words and that sort of thing quickly is, is a lifesaver. So yeah, very useful. Yeah, Naomi is asking about Blackbird. So Blackbird is... Yeah. Uh, the new name for Foreseen. Um, it is very different to that because Blackbird, which is brilliant in its own way, but it's not connected to the Avid. It's quite separate to the Avid. You can import cuts and things from Blackbird into the Avid, but um, it's not embedded within it. And if the edit producer is working on Blackbird, they've almost got a whole different system, haven't they? You've got your rushes and your, your cuts. It's almost different from what the editor's working on. Whereas if the edit producer has Avid as well, you're sharing the project. So anything the edit producer does, the mm. editor can see straight away. Anything the editor's doing, the edit producer can do see straight away, which is very useful, I think, for the remote edit producing as well, for the remote working, because you're sharing more directly, aren't you? I mean, I, I, I just, yeah, I think the whole business of um, edit producers being given Avid laptops is an absolute, you know, no. lifeline. That, well, remote, remote editing aside, because obviously that's a different world, but it's vital for that. But even in a normal edit, when you're sat together, it just means you can, you know, you can divide and conquer, you can do two things at once. You've got, even if it means, right, I've cut this little scene, but I've got to move on to the next thing. I haven't got time to go back and watch it. Could you watch it? Give me your thoughts and then I can make, make the changes. So it just sort of speeds the process up. And I think given the avid, when you get told off now but their, their licensing is it's definitely becoming cheaper so it's not ridiculously expensive to have a to have a, a laptop on the side you know the laptop itself obviously costs money but the software side of it is not prohibitive i don't think and it's definitely a definitely a lifesaver in the edit okay june b is asking everyone and let's ask it to emma first um when first beginning a new project, what's the first three organisational steps you would take? Um, number one is workflow with the production camera team, post team, DIT assistant, post house. Um, schedule with your viewing schedule, making sure you've got realistic timings in for, for notes because that period of time now is um, is quite long, like we're talking a week or longer. Um, and who you're 
who your team is and connecting everyone so that it's an organizational thing but it's the communication so everyone at the moment acts as silos we're all remote but having the connection between everyone is probably the most the best thing you can do for organizing a project okay tom did you want to i'd say roll number roll <laughs> number my lord um it it's re it's really important i've had jobs where i've i get, got into the edit to organize it and there's no date on the roll number and that's on a document somewhere else and i'm like the, as an editor i don't want to i and uh, I, if i'm an editor if i'm editing or if i'm handing to an editor i don't want to have to look at the log until it's the last i don't want to have to open up a spreadsheet unless it's like i've done everything else i want to keep everything in avid and if you can keep that roll number with the most amount of relevant information and so it organizes in avid that helps so so the roll number can be individual to each production but you have to have the date backwards and the reason for that is it will just stack properly in avid there's a reason <laughs> also another weird one is a um, time of day time code and making sure everyone gets a time code right on their machines that's really important. If you can get the, the, the roll number right and the time code situation on your cameras right, half, half of the assistant's job's done. That's a really good idea. And it's great at the end of a series to just sort of take a bit of time to all think about what worked, what didn't work and devise a Bible. And often a Bible is done at the end of a shoot, but... Um, and I, yeah, and I think Pete, you said on SAS, there's a, a Bible is created uh, yeah, moving I think forward. That sort of might be a fairly recent thing and, it, and, and it's definitely helped the, because SAS goes into a finishing suite at the end of the, um, end of the edit. So you want to be able to try and give the finishing editor consistency in terms of you know, how you've laid out your project, your track lay, all that sort of thing. So that they're not, you know, so again, they, they're able to get on with what they're supposed to be doing, which is polishing the, the episode rather than trying to find everything. So it's just that it's, it's the communication and consistency, making sure that, that everyone's sort of playing on the same, you know, with the same material at the same, uh, what am I trying to say? Making sure that it, it kind of, well, consistency, yeah, that everyone's doing the same thing so that they're not having to waste their time doing kind of admin stuff if that makes sense mm. but also even things like the way that you break down the rushes like I, I find I cannot understand the sync map so I need all the rushes broken down into sequences and knowing you, you only know what sequences you need um, when you've done the first episode don't you you know like of a new series so then for the next series you'll have standard sequences which can be pulled out won't you to know yeah, know they, what you need absolutely and hi hindsight's a, a wonderful thing you know when you're on a, a series three or four or something everyone has hopefully learned from previous mistakes and so they're able to say right why right, okay but let's have our you know bin of gvs a bin of extra actuality that that might be you know just moments of people shouting for example on sas you need a lot of people shouting so you might just want a bit of audio every now and again to, to sort of spice up a sequence, but it's kind of finding those bits and pieces so that they uh, they can get on and, and put them in quickly without having to root around. So yeah, it, it's sort of, and, and that's one of those things that the projects, the assistants are great at setting up the projects. So everyone has the same sort of layout, you know, they have their folders, their rushes, their GVs, all that sort of thing. So uh it just and the music obviously which is a, a big thing so it just means that everyone knows where to look for stuff uh and and uh, don't waste too much time trying to root around for it um i i cut my teeth at gold rush i think a lot of people have and their system's phenomenal for at the end everyone sits around and you probably do the same thing with sas now and you go what were the problems how can we make it better and then the next job, they pass that on. And I think that's just 
amazing for any production that wants to move on to another series or even not even to another series just a different show take that information with you and you're just saving yourself so much stress it's amazing i know at the end of it everyone's fatigued and kind of want to go home mm. but like that luck just booking in an extra day of meetings and just mm. and then also i think also everyone feels good because they feel like they've been listened to and that's all what we really want is you feel like you've had like some input and make things better that's it yeah yeah i think i think that is so important i think communication we, we keep on harping on about this but it's often removed from the schedule as a kind of luxury or we don't have time for just having people sitting around talking but mm. actually sharing the knowledge just helps so much doesn't it otherwise you have this chinese whispers gaps in it, in knowledge crucial gaps missing which um, can all be resolved quite easily in retrospect, <laughs> but or and moving forward anyway. If you have the crew in at any point as well, like shooters and PDs, especially if you're just starting as a PD and stuff, and you come and sit in the edit and you can see your shots might be amazing, but they might not like cut together. And just that bit of information back and forth, your next job, you'll be better. And editors will sing your praises as well. And then everyone, it, it, we're all here to help each other. That's the most important thing, I think. So, yeah. Okay. So then we've had a few questions about COVID and remote working. Are there more paper edits now? Um, is the system very different communication wise? How do you deal with viewings and notes? I don't know. Anne-Marie, do you want to talk about, a bit about that or? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm using paper edits, but I always, I prefer paper edits personally. So, so that's what I use. And I just do a, a very basic structure with um, suggestions of shots that I may have seen or a wish list. Does this exist? It would be great here, mm. you know, and that kind of thing. And, and that seems to be working. And then we're using, we transfer a lot. Um, I, my editor, because sometimes my editor ends up working at, until two in the morning because of how disrupted his day has been. So then before he shuts down, he'll retransfer me something. And then that's there for me first thing in the morning. I would look at that, get my reactions to that, and then send him a, an amended script or a, something that he knows. Um, and, that, and that kind of works quite well. Then in terms of um, proper viewings, we've kind of sometimes done shared screens but depending on the Wi-Fi of all the parties, hmm. that can be a bit of a nightmare. So um, we just end up going to WeTransfers again for that and then have a very clear, right, so you need to get this, you need to watch this by a certain time because we end up, you know, I can structure my day differently for the rest of the day, that kind of thing. In terms of working from home, I got myself a second screen so I have my lap, my computer and another screen, and that really helps me in terms of working across viewing rushes or viewing something else. And I and my screen where I can make extra notes, my computer that I can see instead of having to move things around and have a very small sort of image that's my rushes or whatever. Um, but apart from that, no, um, it hasn't hasn't really affected me any other way really yeah days are longer and the schedules madly seem tighter even though I'm working harder the schedule's tighter I don't know how that works but yeah well I think a time is lost in the communication process it's much quicker if you're sitting next to somebody to just sort of say oh what about this that and the other mm, or mm. I can quickly find this for you whereas everything that does take longer when when you're yeah. not in the same room so I I, I but it, it's quite good for working out your own schedule I suppose mm. if, if your your editor's working till two and you don't have to work till two but you're mm. still getting things done that's yeah that's pretty good um there been there was a question from Hinesh. With budgets being made tighter and tighter by channels in COVID times, where do you think cost saving can occur in post-production? Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> How can we save money? 
we yeah production manager seat assistant editors is a luxury which we I think clearly said it is not it is essential so it's definitely can't save money there so where on earth can we save money anyone got any well, ideas I've got an I've got an edit currently which is I mean on paper it should be quite expensive because it's a 20 week long edit with an assistant editor but we've got uh We've got an editor working from home. We've got two directors and an assistant editor. Assistant editors in one day a week. Two directors have got all of our sync pooled interviews on Frame.io with split screen so you can see all the cameras, all the time mm -hmm. codes, and they make notes. So we're a bit more of an efficient edit that way. And I guess mm, working from home is probably a bit cheaper on your edit suite budget as well because we're not paying for a room in Soho but we're trying to make it more efficient in the way that we're working to save money in these times. Oh so people have asked about this Frame.io can you explain how what Frame.io is and how that works? Well, so we're, we're using it as a viewing platform for um, exported rushes which you can make time-coded notes on and you can export those notes in a CSV so you can have them alongside your transcripts as well. But I'm also using it as a as a platform to share archive because I've got an archivist who's in the US and an edit that's in the UK and we're transferring things over. But everyone can also see the archive and we can choose if we don't want to ingest something or not. So it's kind of like a viewing platform for for cuts, but also a viewing platform for your raw rushes or your raw archive. Okay, so then you decide what you want to ingest into the Avid from after watching it in Frame.io? Yeah, that's how we're using it. Okay. And it's saving money by, by not ingesting a five hour long clip because we've looked at it and it's not worth it, you know. All oh, right, so this is a clever way of combating the fact that we've got so many hundreds of hours of rushes nowadays and storing it is expensive. So you're previewing it on not on Avid and then you can decide what to import. Mm -hmm. But what happens if the wrong decision is made and you want something That's different? That's always gonna happen. You can't really get around that. So then you can go back to the frame IO and find something different and put it in. Yeah. Okay, that's an interesting one. So you have to be very um, ruthless in your selection of what's going into the Avid, but not too ruthless. Which is basically no. okay, but wouldn't it be better to sort of brief the people shooting what you actually need and then have less hours footage? <laughs> well, that would be the dream, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think yeah, really quickly that is, and again, like why just more interaction between the shoot and the edit, bring the shooters into the edit, and so or communicate more back and forth. It get, also, I think it will get rid of the, the us and them thing that we get. Because if the shooter comes in and you're like, and tells you this day was a nightmare, this happened, that happened, then in the edit, when you, you see stuff missing, you're like, yeah, I heard that was a bad day. And then you, we can just move on and everyone feels like they're in a nicer team and you, there's a lot more empathy back and forth, I think, anyway. Yeah, definitely. I, I think we're, we're, go, we're going over time and it's Pete's birthday. <laughs> well, we've got a few. We 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 can stay till half past. Actually, we're all right. I booked a long. We booked a long session because we thought there'd be a lot to talk about. So somebody, Haley, is saying she's a post production supervisor. She has eight edits running and an assistant editor. But what are the best ways to communicate? Because she's missing everybody all being together. You see that that's the that's the one thing that I would say is is a disaster about this whole well. Sorry, COVID is obviously a disaster, obviously, <laughs> but in terms of the way TV is made, it, you know, it's a collaborative process. There's supposed to be, it's not just one or two people at the end of the day, it is, it's a team. It's a massive, you know, depending on your production, it's a big team. So that, I couldn't agree more with what Hayley's saying. I miss the sort of camaraderie. I miss hmm. the lunches, you know, going, popping out for a sandwich, chatting, whatever in the corridor. So, so that, when, when this whole, um, working from home started that was the biggest sort of shock to the system to the system really um, and it didn't it wasn't until I think the third job that I did in lockdown that someone the um the series producers set up 
start setting up WhatsApp groups the day before we started the edit. And I was just like, oh God, I'm suddenly on eight new WhatsApp groups. But they were, there was one for like the technical team, there was one for the edit producers, there was, you know, there were various different ones. And whilst a lot of it was not necessarily information that you needed, at least you kind of felt there was a bit of camaraderie. There was a bit of banter on the WhatsApp chat. And, and at the end of the day, you need that, you know, alongside your working pro, your working day, you need to have the kind of five minute of right downtime in my brain. Let's, let's talk rubbish on WhatsApp about, I don't know, last night's game or whatever, but yeah. it just, it, it kind of helps to have that running alongside. It did get a bit out of hand, I'm not going to lie. Some <laughs> days you could have probably fallen into a WhatsApp hole and not done any work because you were spending the whole day replying to messages. But, but the point is it was there and it, and it definitely helps. And I know it's quite basic way of communicating, but, but I think between that and, and Zoom edits, which I have done a few uh, days when I've just literally sat on Zoom with my edit producer and you can mute it when, when the kids come in to ask about the maths homework or whatever, but you know, it, 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 you do need that and, and those sort of tool, tools definitely help. Yeah, it's not the same, but it's something. Exactly, it's something. And I've, there's quite a lot of discussion on various sort of Facebook pages about should edits, you know, should people be given the choice to, to carry on working remotely, you know, in the post-COVID world, post-COVID TV world. And there's a lot of sort of people, you know, there's people on both sides of the argument. And I think, I think there may end up being this sort of balance where you'll you can maybe do a week, I don't know, I suppose it's that thing of maybe you could be given the choice of working from home for part of the edit. I don't think it's helpful to be in the edit, uh, sorry, be at home the whole time. It certainly gets to a point where you need to be collaborative, but um, it, it's quite an interesting debate and I don't think anyone's you know, got the answer to that yet. Well, it's the same for, for many jobs as well, isn't it? A lot of people in non-TV world are thinking, can I work from home rather than going into the office every day? And I think everyone is thinking there are advantages to both, but, but being part of a team and just the sort of picking up little bits of information that aren't like necessarily on an AG, on a, you know, bullet pointed meeting that we must discuss, just little extra bits of information that you just hear about, which are helpful, you miss out on, don't you? Which, yeah. if you're not in the room altogether. Um, okay. The post work point. <laughs> yeah. Really. <clears throat> Has anybody else got any really great money saving tips then, apart from? Frame.io, frame .io, which, uh, um, anything else that might be great moving forward and meetings, having a pre-edit meeting and a post-edit meeting and just sort of sharing information. Then what else have we got? Understanding terminology. Terminology. Understand, I mean, understanding the post quote as well. That's what, that's the other thing I get often oh, yes. asked because everyone has, every post house has a different set of terms as to what they call different things and to look at like Envy, Molyneux, Halo, you know, all together, you're like, what is this? How have they got to this bottom line? And you're, if you get, a, you know, someone who's done that job to look at it and say, well, they're all essentially the same thing, but maybe you need more of this and less of this, that can also save you some cash. Yes, actually, don't some post houses, the quotes seem really great and they've offered you a discount, but then you find out things like the edit producer having the Avid on a laptop, they're going to charge £200 a week mm -hmm. per edit producer. And you're like, oh, suddenly that's a lot of money extra, which yeah. is kind of slightly buried. True. I, I definitely say like, just to have like a, a couple of, not too much paperwork, but yeah, terminology paperwork perfect and and somebody sent me I've, i'll dig it out at one point a, a really funny image of like what camera movements are and it seems like every camera movement when you get referred to is a pan and then there's like no that's not the a pans from like left to like left to right or right to left horizontal and when you're looking for stuff when somebody says oh can you get me this of this and you're looking for a shot and it's the wrong terminology you can spend hours looking for the wrong thing so yeah so just get like a a cheat sheet down for what it is 
So all agree on the same thing and then brilliant. You were in. Mm -hmm. I Love. think one thing that's really difficult, which we haven't really talked about, is the the viewings with, say, the broadcaster, because, you know, they are obviously the client, they are all powerful, but mm. the number of viewings can take a lot of time. The feedback coming in dribs and drabs from lots of different people and suddenly you find out, oh, they've shown their boss and their boss's boss and their boss's 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 boss and mm -hmm. somebody else now has a completely different take on the program mm -hmm. and it's all sort of that all takes a lot of time and I think the bar is so high for producing really great content isn't it and so and so many people want to put their opinions across and and we all have different opinions and they all have different opinions and I don't know how in the edit we manage all of that because that takes a lot of time but is out of our control almost because we're all trying to produce the best possible show that the client is happy with but we don't have any control over the client do we how anyone got any ideas about that <laughs> i mean I, I think there is a it's, it's certainly I, th I found recently that commissioners don't seem to be able to sort of have the final say so like you've said it's, it goes up the ladder and up the ladder whereas I'm pretty sure when back in the day the commissioner came into the you know came into our viewing watched it gave you the notes and those were the notes and mm -hmm. that was kind of it but now it does seem that everyone's involved and yeah. obviously there, there'll be a reason for that but mm -hmm. that needs to therefore be allowed for in the edit schedule to, to you know to say right well if you are going to have six people you know, chipping in their opinions, then please can we have a bit more time to uh, to sort of get those notes done? Or some edit, I know some edits will maybe have a couple of viewings with the commissioner and then it will go higher up the, the sort of chain. And at that point it goes to the finishing suite. So the finishing suite then manages the sort of final, you know, um, draft of notes. But it's certainly, it's certainly not as simple as it used to be. And I think I'm not quite sure why that is, but it, it, it needs to be allowed for time-wise to, to get the get the job done. Is that something, Emma, that you would maybe take on as a and liaise with the commissioner, or do you never actually get given that position? No, I did. I, I did on a film last year for American Murder with um with the Netflix and the Knickerbocker guys. We would send the cut off. They would have two days to watch it. And then when the new, when the notes were due back, we get on a Zoom with the commissioners and our whole team, including myself, and we'd all talk about it for an hour. And then we just get on with our, with our edit. And I found that probably the best notes experience that I've had. Yeah, well, that's yeah. very rare though, isn't it? <laughs> I know. But again, I suppose it, that saying communication is key because actually notes that are written in an email, they're sometimes quite hard to understand, a bit impenetrable. And if you can actually discuss it and then say, well, actually, the reason we did it like this is because or exactly. the reason that person is out of sync and you want them in vision mm -hmm. is because it's from a completely different scene. I'm afraid there's literally yeah. no way of correcting that. But yeah. you can talk about you can it. Have, you can have it at it and you can you can rebut some of the comments in the room, so to say, you know, if you if you need to, if you feel strongly about it. And that's what that's what we did. And it was amazing. That sounds like a much better system. Also, I think if it's written, sometimes people are just getting to the point and, you know, people can feel a bit, you know, personal attacks when it might not even exist. So in, in a Zoom chat, it can be a lot nicer, I suppose. Mm. Cool. Okay. Um, oh, Antonia has got a question for Anne-Marie. Um, it totally makes sense to get through the app before you go beyond a rough part one, but I find SP execs and commissioner editors can't watch a rough part one. So I try to do a polished part one and find they rarely pay too much attention to part three and part four. <laughs> Is that the case? <laughs> Um, there is, there, there's definitely some truth in that. And I always try and make sure that at least the sort of first three minutes or four minutes is tight and it works, even though it feels like it's way too early to do that. I think it just allows them to exhale 
And then you could kind of very easily negotiate the fact that other bits are a little bit rough and, you know, you can talk about the direction you want to go in because they've seen something that has sort of assured them that actually you know what you're doing. Because I, I, in my experience, sometimes um, that first kind of, I just don't want to see anything. It just needs to know, you know, how you're finding the story is really about sort of easing their anxiety. That there definitely is a film in there. There definitely is a story. Yes, that per that person that you cast is is going to work. You know, they are going to deliver certain things that you want. Um, and that then makes them sort of calm down a bit and give you the space to do the rest of it. Um, I mean, I've, I've had sort of viewings where you sort of do a really, really polished three minutes and then you rough, rough out the rest of part one. And then you kind of do a little bit of a, the same at the beginning of part two and you rough out the rest and they kind of, the whole atmosphere in the room completely changes. That's true, definitely. Yes, I mean, they have different expectations, don't they, commissioners? But I think more and more they can't watch a rough cut and black holes are a big no-no. Oh, which black is... holes, definitely, yeah. Even if you put the wrong shot in it, you just, or you put something that's just a filler, mm -hmm. or you put something, yeah, black holes, definitely a no-no. They just go into screaming, their they brain starts screaming. They don't know how to edit. <laughs> Especially Americans, they, I mean, I literally had a conversation about rough cuts in, in a pre-meeting, and, and I was like, how rough can a rough cut be? And they were like, Joe, you cannot be thinking of sending a rough, rough cut. I was like, um... <laughs> Well, I just wanted to know, you know, like, you know, can there be any black holes? Joe, the rough cut cannot be rough. What are you talking about? It needs to be a fine cut at rough cut stage. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly <laughs> <it>. <laughs> Sorry. That's so that's another cut. way where you have to get the terminology right. Never assume a rough cut is rough. No. If it's being shown to anyone apart from between you and your editor. Mm. they'll just think that you can't edit honestly they start freaking out and thinking uh you do know how to edit you know in England I mean you know <laughs> so <laughs> um yeah which is it, when you haven't got very much time trying to make a really polished rough cut is actually really stressful isn't it but and, and it can I, be a bit soul destroying when you do a polished rough cut and then you just have to tear it all apart, all apart. <laughs> <laughs> but it is what it is. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Well, I think we probably, um, oh yeah, Hinesh is saying, call the cut project final, rough final. Final, <laughs> final, final. Yeah. yeah. Never call anything final, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's all sorts of weird terminology coming up, which I've never heard of. Da Vinci Resolve. Oh, that's, a, that's, um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a grading software that you also use to make dailies or ingest on. So um, just a new bit of software to learn. That's what we love as edit assistants. Oh my gosh. <laughs> There's so many new things. I'm going to have to leave here and research Frame.io. What were the other things? Frame.io. Slack for conversations. Slack. I mean, you could yeah, spend Slack. all day on these yeah. different Slack. things, couldn't Slack. you? And it in Slack. I suppose yeah. it's finding the right systems for you and your editor and for your project. If um, just a quick one for me, because uh, I love to hear my own voice, but um, just really quickly, I would love it if moving forward, we more productions got a better work, like a, a really clean workflow. And if anyone wants to come to me on my email and discuss it and we go forward about using assistance or talking to other assistants about kind of pooling our knowledge from these kind of things and just make everything much cheaper, quicker and stress-free and nicer, that, that would be great. That's what I really want out of the end of this. I want everyone to have a job where the editors are happy, the edit assistants are happy and, and the budget comes in correct and not overdue. And that's just a dream, isn't it? And then we just have the best program we can make. That's the main thing. Sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Um, 
One last question from Simon. Can a person direct and edit a film or does the editor always have to be a second pair of eyes? What do you editors think? I mean, I would say two heads. There's, there's a reason the expression two heads is better than one exists, isn't there? I mean, yes, you, yes, the answer you probably can, um, but generally speaking, collaborative workflow seems to work best, I would say. Yeah. I think there's a degree of separation that the editor will have Absolutely. from from the footage mm. so that will uh, you may may have done that beautiful shot or have that lovely bit of sync that you really love but it doesn't work mm. and the editor will come in and say yeah it doesn't work and that you'll be better off for it i think definitely definitely all right well thank you so much everybody and um have a great rest of the day and a weekend <laughs> yeah and uh, let's onwards and upwards with fantastic, smooth running, efficient, creative, wonderful edits. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Watch this space. That's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone. <laughs>